All right. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, today we got Lacey Smith with uh, actually a joint appointment, right, with NRCS and Department or DNR. Uh, yep. And so she's going to talk a little bit about uh, establishing polymer errors on a large scale and, and some of the NRCS programs. So just a reminder that next week, last week we had uh, postponed the talk. So next week we'll have another talk on June 8th. Same time, same place, same link. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lacey and you should be able to share your screen now. Um, have you used them before, Lacey? Yes, let's see here. Let me bring should up. be able to share. I will use it in a PDF. <laughs> there we go. Since the internet's lagging a little bit, I'll bring it up in a PDF and that should make it a little bit easier. Let's see here. Let me shrink this down. There we go. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? All good? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So hi, everybody. My name is Lacey Smith. Oh, we good. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Lacey Smith. I am a partner biologist with the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources and the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, this evening, I want to talk about how you can create a pollinator habitat with NRCS. And I'm also going to highlight smaller scale ones because pollinator gardens because I like those as well. So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, if there's, I guess if, you, if I'm talking too fast or if you guys can't hear me, you know, just let me know. Stop me and I'll stop. <laughs> oh no, let's see here. Okay, so first of all, what is a pollinator? Well, a pollinator is an animal or insect that transfers pollen from one plant to another. Common examples are bees, flies, beetles, moths, butterflies, wasps, and birds. Uh, bees are our primary pollinators for most of our plants and wild crops, or got that mixed up, so our, for our crops and wild plants. And then hummingbirds are the only pollinator with a backbone in our region. So anytime I do a presentation, I always like to bring up at least one fun fact about a pollinator. And for today, I wanna to talk about uh, bees. So a fun fact about bees is that they actually have five eyes. So the two large ones are compound eyes, and then the three on top are simple eyes. And that's why, you know, you feel like a bee can always see you coming, you know, if you're trying to get a photo or whatever, it's because they have five eyes, so they have great vision. So another fun fact about pollinators is that 25% of native bees in our area are a pollen specialist, and a pollen specialist will collect pollen from one species, genus, or family. Uh, over here is a giant, well not a giant, but a small, list of host plants that support pollen specialist. Um, my favorite host plant for pollen specialists would have to be the uh, bee balm, so wild bergamot, the monarda species. I absolutely love those. Uh, my favorite uh, pollen specialist bee would have to be the squash bee, this cutie right here. They look very similar to a honeybee, but they're a little more, I think, fuzzier, a little more yellow, a little more bright, and absolutely adorable. So why should we care about pollinators? Well, most of all is because pollinators pollinate. So more than 80% of our plants require a pollinator to successfully reproduce. Uh, one third of the food we eat or one in three bites depend on a pollinator. Uh, without pollinators, we wouldn't have our coffee, we wouldn't have our chocolate, almonds, strawberries, blueberries, most of our fruit. Um, and then pollinators help ensure plant diversity and plant diversity helps ensure pollinator diversity. So maybe you're not really into bugs, but you're really into plants. Well, we wanna support those beneficial insects so we can still have those beneficial plants. Um, and then another great one is that pollinators provide uh, fruit and seeds from the successful pollination, which that can help support our wildlife. And then pollinators themselves are a food source for wildlife. So a lot of birds depend on caterpillars to feed their young or to eat for themselves. So unfortunately, pollinators are in decline. Uh, pollinators face pressure from invasive species, habitat removal, pathogens, and an improper use of pesticides. 40% of pollinator species are at risk of extinction worldwide. Uh, so our moths and butterflies, our bees, our beetles are most at risk. Uh, in North America alone, bumblebee populations have declined 46%. Um, even the managed honeybee, which is non-native, is also declining at approximately 1% per year, which is pretty significant. 
So what can we do to help our pollinators? Well, probably one great way to help out our native pollinators or honeybees is to create a pollinator habitat. And ideally large scale is where it's at, but any size is beneficial for our pollinators. And what's great about NRCS, they offer uh, financial and technical assistance on creating a pollinator habitat. Uh, to qualify for the financial assistance, the habitat must be at least one tenth of an acre. Um, if you want to use like a smaller scale, um, you wouldn't qualify for the financial, but you would always qualify for the technical assistance. Um, the habitat can be created using native species with various bloom periods and shapes and colors, and you can also use uh, woody species if you'd prefer to have trees and shrubs, but for this talk I'm going to mainly focus on using wildflowers. So, uh, what are the key steps for a successful pollinator habitat? So the number one most important step to creating a pollinator habitat is site preparation. This one is number one. So for site preparation, you want to choose the right method for your landscape, your equipment availability, how much you want to spend, how much time you want to put into it, and your physical capability. Um, another very important step in creating a pollinator habitat is making sure you are selecting plants that are appropriate for your environment. So for example, do not uh, select species that require a lot of soil moisture if your soil is very dry, or you know, if you have very wet soil, don't try to put a plant in there that requires, requires dry soil. Um, if you decide to use seeds, you need to make sure you are seeding at the appropriate times. If you would put it out there during the middle of summer, you're probably not gonna have very good success. Um, weed maintenance, uh, whenever you are early establishing a pollinator habitat, you need to make, make sure that weedy species or invasives aren't going in and undoing everything you've done. And then you, like a lot of people sometimes forget about later on is that you need to maintain plant diversity over time. Now this is just an overview and now we're gonna go through and break these down. But let's talk about site prep. So site prep is the process of removing existing vegetation and or competition from the area. So this is number one, very, very important. Um, I'm going to highlight a few options today. There are more than this, but these are the ones I know I'm more familiar with and that I tend to like more. So uh, the first one is sod removal. This one is more ideal for a pollinator garden. So small scale, as you can see, you know, you do not want to do this large scale. Like this is very laborious. Um, soil solarization. This one's ideal for sizes less than half an acre. <clears throat> Sheet mulching, same thing. You want to do it less than half an acre. Uh, smother cropping, you can do that as big as you want. And same thing with herbicide. <clears throat> oh, see, uh, these documents here and this PowerPoint has practically been created from these resources. If you would be interested in getting paper copies of these or having these directly emailed to you, just contact me at the end of this presentation or email me and I can send those out to you, which these ones are absolutely fantastic. Love them. So this is my question I get during farm visits. It's asking me how big is the one acre? One acre is a very common size that folks want to create a pollinator habitat. So I am guilty of this. Uh, before I actually really hardcore investigate how big one acre is, I would just tell people, oh, it's about the size of a football field, which is not quite accurate. Um, a football field is approximately like 57,000 square feet. And one acre is actually around 40, was well, is 43,560 square feet. So I guess visualizing a football field is easier, but just keep in mind that a football field is only 75% um, of, or no, one acre is 75% of a football field. So just a little bit smaller. So something to keep in mind. All right, so the first site preparation that I wanna talk about is of course the smaller one. So sod removal. So what is sod removal? Well, this is where you remove existing vegetation by cutting the roots and removing the sod. Uh, you can use either a shovel or you can rent a sod cutting machine, which I would recommend because this is hard work. <laughs> uh, where would you want to do this? Like I said before, you want this small site, you know, less than around, around an eighth of an acre or smaller. Uh, this is ideal for converting sections of lawns into a poll pollinator garden. And that's what I did for mine. This is my pollinator garden here in Morgantown. And that's how we did it. We went through and got rid of the sod and planted plugs and seeds. 
So when would you want to do this? So generally you'd wanna do this during um, late summer or fall. Um, if you're using seeds, you seed in the fall or winter. And uh, if you're using live plants, you would transplant them in either fall or spring. All right, so uh, the way I created this PowerPoint, I made it more ideal to turn into a PDF for you to keep for your personal use or to share with others. So throughout it, I give the steps on how to do whatever site prep that you want. So then later after this talk, you know, maybe you don't remember exactly what steps, you have a nice you know, path to see what you need to do. All right, so for sod removal, this one's pretty easy, mainly just three steps. So step one, you want to pre-water the area at least one day in advance to kind of loosen up the soil before cutting. I did not do this and it was very difficult. I wish I would have known this before and I think it would have made my life a lot easier. Uh, step two, you know, you cut the sod strips from the selected area and you remove from site. Uh, the sod will be heavy, so you might want some help with this or, you know, have a wheelbarrow nearby that you can put it in and roll it off site. Uh, step three, either seeds or plants. If you are using seeds, you sow them into the bare soil during late fall or winter because seeds need periods of cold, wet, moist periods to wake up from dormancy. And that's why I generally recommend not seeding in the spring because it might not be moist and cold enough. It might warm up too soon or the ground might be too dry, maybe you know, too frozen. So that's why I always like to recommend fall because that way you have enough time for them to wake up from dormancy. Um, if you decide to go plants, which is a lot faster, you want to transplant them and in the spring or the fall, you can do it in the summer. Just you will probably have to help them out a little bit more, probably help water, maybe make sure the soil stays moist until they adjust to their new environment. All right, so soil solarization. This is another great method that I really like. So what is soil solarization? So this is where you um, terminate or, or kill existing vegetation by heating and smothering by using greenhouse plastic. Uh, this one's what makes it so great is it also helps reduce the seed weed bank which is you know, absolutely great if you feel like you're constantly fighting weeds. Uh, this one, you know, half an acre is still decent size, but you can also even do it for a small scale for a pollinator garden versus like a habitat. Uh, ideal locations, nice sunny areas. You know, this is solarization, so we need some sunshine. This is not ideal in shady areas, more than likely will not work. So for this one, you want to begin in the spring and it can take, you know, two to 12 months to kill all the weeds potentially longer if it's more of a shady area or if the competition's you know, really extreme. Uh, for this one, uh, very similar to the other one, seed in the fall or do your plants in the fall or the spring. So here are the steps to soil solarization. So step one, you, know, you mow down the area, you want it nice and smooth because you do not want anything to poke through the plastic. Uh, you irrigate thoroughly and then you lay down the UV stabilized plastic uh, you dig a trench around the perimeter and then you bury the edges. Now this is key. If you do not bury the edges, airflow will get in there and it turns more into like a happy greenhouse instead of, you know, killing existing plants. So you do not want that. Um, for this one, you assess the weed pressure once you get closer to fall. Um, if there's not a lot of weeds left, great. Go ahead and remove them by hand. Um, if the weed pressure is still really high, I would recommend repeating the process. Otherwise, whenever you put the seeds down, you're going to have all that competition again, which you don't want that. Um, so if you decide to go, just like the other ones, if you want to do uh, seeds, you do that in the fall or during the winter. You can do it during the spring, but more than likely you will have to add more seeds again in the fall. So if you just want to save some money and time, just do it in the fall or winter. And then, of course, uh, remember to check for plastic holes throughout the season. Uh, the holes will allow airflow and make the project not successful. So if you have maybe a lot of deers in your, or deer in your area, you know, just go through and make sure that they haven't walked across and put any holes. Um, I always recommend having the greenhouse plastic tape on hand ready to fix repairs as soon as you see them. All right, so uh, this is something I've noticed a good bit. A lot of times when they want, people want to use soil solarization, I've heard people recommending black plastic, which is not ideal. You do not want to use black plastic. You want to use clear plastic as it is more effective. Uh, we want the clear because it traps in the heat just like the greenhouse effect. 
So at the cute little diagram down here kind of illustrates that. But it will not destroy the weed seed viability. So the weed bank will still be there. So it's decently effective, but if you want to save time and money in the long run, just use the clear plastic. So as you can see here, happy Mr. Sun, uh, inserting uh, solar radiation throughout the plastic, and then the solarization or the solar radiation can not escape the plastic. So this creates a nice baking of the weed seeds and the live plants, which is absolutely awesome. Uh, and then plastic thickness, very important to know. So the Xerces Society recommends using four or six mil UV stabilized plastic. So now I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons of those. So four mil can heat soil slightly higher and is less expensive. Um, unfortunately, the four mil is more likely to rip and also less likely to last for several seasons. Uh, the six mil is commercially available, is more commercially available than the four mil but unfortunately it tends to be more expensive, but it's less likely to rip and you can use it for more seasons. So, you know, just pros or cons, you know, if price is more, you know, of a concern, maybe go with a four mil, but if you want to use that plastic, you know, several, several, several times, I would recommend maybe going for the six mil. Because what some folks like to do, they'll do, you know, their half acre or whatever smaller section first, and they'll do that for one season and then they will reuse the plastic and take it to another section, either right beside it or across it or somewhere else on the property, and then they will soil solarize that section as well to put in another pollinator habitat, which is great. So those are just some options. <clears throat> All right, uh, sheet mulching. Uh, this one is, I found very interesting. So this one kills existing vegetation and prevents seeds by germinating by smothering and by using carbon and nitrogen rich mulch layers. So where would you wanna use this one? This one is ideal for smaller sites. So around half an acre and smaller. Um, this is really ideal, I think more for like lawns, uh, shady areas. So like if you have a shady area but you are interested in the soil solarization, this is a great alternative. Um, unfortunately though, this one is not ideal if you have um, deep rooted perennial or rhizom rhizomious or woody weeds. So if maybe if you're trying to smother, I don't know, like the Bradford pear or another very annoying woody species, this would not be ideal. You would not want to choose this. This is ideal for a lawn. Um, you know, if you're just trying to take out grass, that's better for it. <clears throat> so when would you want to do this one? So this one you begin in the winter to late spring. Uh, this one can take a very long time. This one can take three to 24 months to smother. So if you were impatient, I wouldn't recommend this one. Uh, this one's just like the other ones, seed in the fall, or if you're using live plants, plant them in the fall or the following spring. All right, so this one is the steps to create it. Let me move that out. Mulching, I saw other people on the internet call it garden lasagna, and I have been obsessed with it ever since, so I just love calling it that. All right, so the step one, you mow the existing vegetation. You know, you want it, the grass nice and short, nice and flat, nice and smooth. Um, and then they recommend aerating uh, the soil, especially if it's compact. So you can use a pitchfork or whatever tool you got, you know, to get some airflow in there. And then step three is where you layer the garden lasagna and you make sure you water or add the sauce uh, to each layer. So the first layer, uh, you use grass clippings, green prunings, coffee grounds, etc. cetera. Uh, layer two, you you use cardboard, some more paper, newspaper, recycled paper. Uh, layer three, you want to use compost, eggshells, coffee grounds, grass clippings, green prunings. Uh, layer four is cardboard once again. Layer five is compost, either, you know, animal or plant materials. And then the top layer is the wood chips, bark, sawdust, and shavings, and then remembering to water each layer thoroughly. Very, very important. Um, step four, you let the garden lasagna bake <laughs> for three 24 months. Um, if you are seeding, you will want to remove layer six, so the top layer, um, so that seeds have direct contact with the compost or soil. Um, and then, of course, this one, like the other ones, you seed in late fall or early winter. 
Um, if you're using live plants, you can plant them directly in the top layer, the woody layer, the wood chips, uh, in the fall or following spring. And then here's like a nice, give me an idea of guess how high above the ground it will be. And then here is the chart from the Xerxes Society, how it breaks down to creating the garden lasagna. Uh, for this one, you would write down, I guess, what materials you are using all the way up to the top layer. Um, and then it discusses carbon-based and nitrogen-based materials, because as you look, where is it? Oh, oh, right here. So top layer, of course, tells you it's carbon-based, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen. Maybe you're not sure, oh, is this nitrogen-based? You can just look here at the table, and it will tell you, which I really like that. And it's great, so if you would want to print out this PDF or you just wanted uh, this source directly, you can fill it out and that way you will remember what you put there, which I really like. All right, so smother cropping. So this one's really cool. So this is where you use cover crops to reduce weeds by smothering, generally by using broadleaf plants. Um, the cover crops that you use will grow quickly and produce large amounts of above ground biomass. That's best, that's what you want to choose. Um, the cover crops are usually terminated before going to seed, but generally that is saved until the second round, which I'll get at, into that more. Uh, the Xerxes Society recommends using buckwheat or lacy phacelia. Uh, I, I like to recommend the buckwheat. I think it's more appropriate for this area, but you know, it's your property, so that's your ultimate decision. All right, so where would you want to use smother cropping? So sunny areas with low to moderate weed pressure is ideal. Um, if you are already familiar with using cover crops, definitely recommend it. Um, and also if you have access to the proper equipment, this one you need some equipment. So you need to make sure you have access to uh, cultivation equipment, seeding equipment, disc mower, roller, crimper, all that fun jazz. So this one is something I would not recommend for like a pollinator garden. This is more large scale. And if you have access to equipment or your neighbor will let you borrow it or if you can rent it from someone. So when would you do this one? So this one, you want to start prepping the soil in early spring. And like the other ones, you want to seed in late. Oh, this one's different, sorry. <laughs> you seed in late spring, but the wildflower mix you'd want to add in the fall. All right, so uh, smother cropping has a lot of steps. So <laughs> brace yourself. So step one, you want to lightly disc the soil uh, one or two inches in early spring once the soil is dry enough. Uh, you do not want to do this whenever it's still wet or the soil get all cloggy and it's just it's not a good time. Um, after that, you wait two to three weeks for the organic matter to, de to decompose and you cultivate at a shallow depth of less than two inches. Uh, step three, once the soil temperatures have reached around 65 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, lightly harrow, rake, scratch the soil surface to remove any leftover vegetation or debris. We want nice seed to soil contact. Uh, step four, uh, you do this immediately after removing the debris. Uh, this is where you uh, put down the seed. Um, which route you go depends on, I guess, your equipment availability. So if you are drill seeding, you will want to use around 50 to 60 pounds an acre, and you want to drill at half to one inch depth. Uh, you definitely do not want to drill the seeds too deep or they will not, uh, I guess, wake up. <laughs> uh, they won't re receive enough sunlight and they will not germinate. So never put them in too deep. Make sure you always calibrate your seed drill. Um, broadcast seeding is another great option, but unfortunately with that one, you have to use more seeds. You need to use 70 to 96 pounds per acre. Um, and if your, I guess, area is more drought prone, so a lot drier, you need to increase the rate of seed even more. Uh, whenever you put down the seeds, you want to make sure the soil is moist enough prior to planting. Uh, of course, seeds to wake up from dormancy, they need moisture. And so if the ground is too dry, you might have to irrigate it yourself. Um, then of course, you want to avoid if the soil is too wet, as that will make it even harder for them to get things started. So not too dry, but not too wet. So after you put the seeds out, you need to wait at least one week so you can see um, the germination, make sure things woke up. <laughs> um, if you see gaps, you need to go in and add seeds there because with smother cropping, we need a nice thick layer 
of the cover crops. So if we have bare areas, that's going to be an area where the weed seeds, weed plants are still going to do well. So, you know, go back through, find some gaps, add some more cover crop seeds to that area. So then after that, you need to wait six weeks um, after seeding and or after flowering. Uh, you can either terminate the buckwheat if it has done enough smothering. Uh, with just one round, more than likely not, you probably need to do it again. So um, what I would recommend is to wait on termination um, period because you want the, the seeds from the buckwheat to go back into the ground so maybe you don't have to buy as much seeds. So maybe just wait. Um, but, but if you believe that um, it's smothered enough of the weedy species, uh, go ahead and terminate before it goes to seed. Otherwise, you're going to have another round of buckwheat coming. And then what's great about using buckwheat, it provides flowers and pollen and nectar to pollinators. So while you are smothering weedy species, you are also feeding pollinators, which is absolutely beneficial. Okay, so then step seven, this is where you assess the weed pressure. Um, if you still got a lot of the perennial plants hanging around, um, you wanna go ahead and lightly cultivate, you know, tear it up a little bit and wait another three days. Um, reseed the buckwheat, uh, make sure the soil is moist because you know the seeds need that moisture to wake up. Excuse me, so then we wait another six weeks. And then this time we terminate the cover crop before it goes to seed because we do not want three, round, three rounds of buckwheat unless you know there's still a lot of weed pressure, which there could be, you might need it, but more than likely two rounds should be enough. So for this one, um, uh, if the site has moderately high weed pressure, you might have to repeat this for a second year. Um, if so, you know, you do that again, and then you see the wildflowers in the fall or the spring. But just keep in mind, you know, if you do it in the spring, you're probably going to need more seeds again. Uh, if the area has low weed pressure, you can just go ahead and seed the wildflower mix that fall. You don't have to do it next fall. Um, if the area has a high risk of soil erosion, I would recommend adding some uh, oats to the mix. Uh, you'd want to seed the oats in August through September-ish. Um, you want to mix that in with your, your wildflower mix, which is great, um, as the oats will frost kill, forming a nice mat on the soil surface, which can help reduce the soil erosion and help limit how much, I guess, your wildflower seeds would be washed away. Uh, these are uh, found in the organic site prep uh, file that the Xerces Society made, uh, discusses the buckwheat and lacy facilia, if you, that interests you. Uh, this is the table that they have in there, which is absolutely great, breaks it down a lot better than what I can, it's a great file. So that's definitely worth looking at. Uh, here's the link down here if that interests you. All right, uh, the last site prep method that is probably the most popular for large scale pollinator habitats and also sometimes people use this for pollinator gardens. Um, if the area is a little bit bigger than what they, I guess, want to remove by hand is herbicide. So what is herbicide? Well, herbicides are used to disrupt the growth and development of undesirable plants. Um, of course, with herbicide or any other type of spray, you want to avoid spraying plants while they are in bloom to protect our pollinators and other beneficial insects. If you are spraying, you know, herbicide on maybe autumn olive, because, you know, autumn olive, uh, that increases the chances of a pollinator getting on the flower and consuming the contaminated pollen and nectar or taking it back to their hive or their colony and, you know, getting their young sick. So just avoid spraying stuff while they're in bloom. So where are herbicides commonly used at? Uh, they are commonly used in landscaping and agricultural settings. Um, herbicides uh, are used in areas with low risk of water quality impacts and soil erosion. Uh, for soil erosion, because herbicide generally works so quickly, if it's an area that has extremely high risk of soil erosion, you want to take other steps to try to limit that. So when do people use herbicides? Well, herbicides are commonly use uh, spring through summer while plants are actively growing. And that's the key to making herbicide most successful is to um, spray plants while they were actively growing. 
So uh, herbicides are generally straight to the point, you know, always make sure you follow the label instructions 100%. So step one, you mow the area as low as possible in early spring and make sure you remove the debris. You know, you wanna make sure you can see stuff growing. So, you know, read the label of whatever herbicide you're using and then reread it again. Make sure that you understand exactly, you know, the risks, uh, steps that you need to take and how to protect yourself and others and uh, pollinators. So make sure you follow the instructions. Uh, step three, um, or excuse me, so you need to apply the weeds whenever they are actively growing. Uh, step three, you more than, if it's a very, I guess there's a lot of competition, you will probably have to repeat additional treatments every six weeks or whenever the weed seedlings reach around four to six inches tall in the growing season. Generally, a lot of people need to do at least two treatments of herbicide to get them under control. But you know, if there's a lot of competition or there's some very aggressive uh, native plants or there's very aggressive invasive plants, you might have to do at least three, but it varies from site to site. So after that, you wait at least three days after the last herbicide treatment before putting the seed mix down. You know, the minimum's at least three days. Myself, I would probably wait at least a week just to make sure everything's good and you're not, you know, damaging any of uh, your wildflower mix because that tends to be a little pricey. So now we've covered all the options. Well, I guess we discovered, we discussed some of the options for site preparation. And now I want to highlight selecting appropriate seeds or plants um, for a pollinator habitat to be most successful to native pollinators, you need to select native plants. So, um, for example, I always like to choose uh, flowers that vary in bloom time, shapes, and colors, and that is also a requirement for NRCS. Uh, NRCS requires you to select at least three species in each bloom period, but even though that's the minimum requirement, uh, the seed mixes we've already pre-made have anywhere between 20 to 30 species because we want to be able to support a wide range of pollinators and, you know, there's pollinator specialists, you know, there's bee pollen specialists. So we like to have a wide array of different options. And then whenever you're thinking about that, you also need to make sure you are selecting plants that correspond with your light and soil moisture availability. So for example, if you have like a very dry site, do not select swamp milkweed. It will not do well because swamp milkweed likes moist to wet soils. But you're like, oh, I want, you know, milkweed to help a declining species, the monarch butterfly. So what I would recommend instead is selecting butterfly milkweed. Uh, that's the orange one, that's uh, tuberosa. You would want to select that one because that milkweed likes dry, well-drained soils. So that way you can still help a declining pollinator, but also selecting a plant that will actually thrive in that area. And then as I discussed before, you know, make sure you select species with various bloom times because we want to make sure there is a pollen and nectar resource throughout the whole growing season. So um, early in the spring, we have our queen bumblebees emerging from um, overwintering. So, you know, they're going to be hungry. And so that way we'll make sure we have something immediately for them whenever they come out of hibernation. Um, the mid-year, you know, we have a good bit of our pollinators are out and about, you know, they need their, their food. The monarch butterfly, you know, will be migrating and laying eggs. We need to make sure we have stuff for her to survive on and to reproduce. Uh, and then late, we also have a lot of migrating pollinators. We want to make sure we have uh, food availability for that. And then also there's enough pollen and nectar resources for a bee or whatever other pollinator to have enough reserves to overwinter. Let's see. So why do we want native plants for pollinator habitats? Well, other than, you know, I think they're way cooler, uh, native plants attract and support more native pollinators. So native pollinators and native plants have co-evolved together. So they know each other and some of them, you know, immediately depend on them and they cannot select other species. Uh, another great reason to select native plants for your pollinator habitat is that native plants are not invasive. They can be aggressive, but they cannot by definition be invasive. Um, another great reason to select native plants 
especially in a pollinator garden or near your garden is that pollinator uh, native plants can support native predator insects, which is really great for garden protection. So, you know, that helps bring in some ladybugs and some other great ones that help take out, you know, things we don't want attacking our cucumbers or tomatoes or good stuff. Um, another great reason to select native plants is that native plants are naturally adapted to local soils, climates, and conditions. So that means they will have reduced need for fertilizer, water, and pesticides, which is great. So that means they're much more easily managed and will require less of your time, which is great. Um, if you go to purchase plants for your pollinator garden or pollinator habitat, uh, make sure you avoid plants that have been treated with neonicotinoids. So neonicotinoids or neonics, which is a lot easier to say, are a group of insecticides used widely on farms and urban landscapes. Um, neonics uh, are moderately to highly toxic to uh, most of our pollinators, um, especially most of the studies on their, um, oh, the lethalness or toxicity has mostly been done on honeybees. So the top two here are moderately toxic and the bottom four, I'm not even gonna try, try, not even gonna try to pronounce it, are highly toxic to honeybees. And if you look at the chart here created by the EPA, so this is the LD, so lethal dose of 50% of whatever group test it takes to kill the group, so 50%. So to kill 50% of a group of honeybees, uh, it takes only less than two micrograms to be highly toxic. Uh, to be moderately toxic, it takes anywhere between two to 10.99 micrograms. So not very much to be absolutely toxic to a pollinator. Um, if that's not bad enough, so why are they so bad? Well, one, one of the greater reasons why neonics are so bad is that they have a long lifespan. So neonics can reside in, the so reside in the soil for months to years after a single application. And what's, you know, even worse, um, if you purchase a plant that has been treated with neonics and put it into your pollinator garden, uh, it can actually leach some of that uh, insecticide into the soil and untreated plant neighbors nearby can actually take it up into their plants. So then now you have, you purchased one plant that was treated with neonics and now you have, you know, maybe three or four, maybe five other plants that are now impacted by neonics. And what makes it so bad is that this insecticide is systemic. So, you know, even if you would put it just like on the leaf or wherever, it's going to be taken up through the entire plant. So every part of the plant would be affected. So you will now have pollen and nectar, or even the leaves that are going to have the neonics in it. So if you know a hungry caterpillar eats a leaf, well now it's ingested a neonic. Uh, if you have like a bee or a butterfly come by and consume some of the nectar, now it's consumed the neonic. Or if you have a bee coming by to collect the pollen and taking it back to the hive or colony, now they have come in contact with the neonic and now they're going to be feeding their young, the neonics, which can be sublethal to lethal. Um, if it ends up just being sublethal, uh, it can impact their flight, learning skills, and reduce taste sensitivity. And for honeybees, it's even been shown for them to not be able to find their way back home. Um, all of these things can lead to death eventually. Um, so it's things that definitely want to avoid these. Um, this insecticide can be lethal directly or indirectly to pollen and nectar collecting insects. So are beneficial insects that you do not want any of this. So just, you know, if you are purchasing a plant from a nursery or a hardware store where you get it from, you know, just check out the tag and see if it says treated by neonics. A lot of times they're not just writing neonics on the tag. It might just be like this plant is protected from blah, 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 blah. So that's something to watch out for. Um, worst case, maybe just ask the nursery directly if you're at the hardware store, they're probably not going to know immediately if it's been treated with neonics or not. So you might just have to Google whatever company it's from and check out their web page and see if they share that information or contact them directly. So if you want to go buy plants and now you're like, oh, I don't know where I can find some that haven't been treated with all these harsh chemicals or where can I even order some around here? Here is a small list of native plant nurseries that I have found that are either in our area 
or offer um, shipping, which is great because I don't know if you guys have noticed, there's not a lot of native plant nurse. I have not been able to find very many, uh, but these ones are you know either neighboring states or we'll mail them over for you which is absolutely websites. I definitely recommend checking them out. Let's see, uh, I think Sam's Plant, uh, that one's located in Morgantown. I think Seven Bends might be West Virginia as well, but I think most of these are Pennsylvania or Maryland. To go the seed route to save some money because buying plants can be very expensive. They, are, they generally range at least five dollars uh, a plant which can be very expensive i would recommend going uh seeds if you want to save some money so um, you guys probably know this by now because i've been saying it over and over but uh you want to seed in the fall and definitely especially for early flowering species uh the exposure to cold temperatures and moist conditions during winter will help stimulate germination in the spring um, you can do it in the spring uh, if the temperatures and soil moisture is still right, but it's just not as good as fall. And then um, if you maybe miss these time frames altogether, maybe you're starting, you know, late spring, early summer, and you still want to get something started, um, you can do artificial stratification. Uh, this is where you artificially wake up seeds in, from dormancy using the refrigerator, which is awesome. I've done it. It's great. Um, just keep in mind that each species uh, will vary with the amount of time it needs in the refrigerator. Um, so wild lupin, for example, only needs 10 days very fast, but for that one, it also requires scarification. So you have to scratch it, then put it in either a sand mixture or just in a plastic bag with a um, moist paper towel, not wet, or it'll mold and you'll lose your seed. Um, and then there's swamp milkweed, which only takes 30 days. And then there's Ohio spiderwort, which which takes uh, 120 days to wake up from dormancy. So for that one, I always like to recommend, you know, start that one outside because otherwise it's going to be in the refrigerator for such a long amount of time. And you'll be constantly checking the paper towel to make sure it's not moldy, which is, you don't want that, and it'll stick too. So, all right, so where can you purchase seeds from? Uh, these are the seed sources that I'm aware of that all have great options. Um, if you are going large scale, I would recommend um, OPN, Ernst, and Roundstone. These ones have very reasonable prices for, you know, acres, half acres, whatnot. Um, for Sam's Plants and Prairie Moon Nursery, those ones are more ideal for like a pollinator garden. Uh, if you purchased half an acre or an acre's worth of seed from like a Prairie Moon Nursery, you'd be breaking the bank because it'd be expensive. Like Prairie Moon, I like them. They're great. I like them as they have like, you know, if I'm looking for a specific individual plant, they're great, but definitely you would not want to choose them for large scale because it would be too expensive. And also whenever you are purchasing seeds, ideally you want to purchase ones that are within our um, eco range, which Ohio is in Ohio. Ernst, I think is in Pennsylvania and the Roundstone is in Kentucky. So those ones are really great. So um, after you get your seeds or plants in the ground, uh, weed maintenance becomes important. So during the first two years of establishment, pollinator habitats need help keeping invasive species and weeds out. So you can do this either by uh, mowing, uh, removing them by hand, or spot spraying with herbicides. But just remember, you know, if they're in flower, you want to wait because you, know, you don't want to hurt your pollinators. You want to build a pollinator habitat, not a trap for them. Um, the, another great way to help keep the invasives and weedies species out of your pollinator garden is to remove or keep mowing existing vegetation around your pollinator habitat, uh, especially during the first two years to help ensure longstanding and success. Uh, whenever you are spot spraying, mowing or whatever, you know, make sure you are not destroying beneficial wildflowers and make sure you're not confusing them for weeds. I know for my pollinator garden, a lot of times if I'll see something growing and I'm not sure, you know, like, are you a weed? Or are you a flower? What I like to do, I like to wait a little bit, let it get a little bit bigger. So then it's easier to identify before ripping it out. Because I know myself a few times, I have ripped out some good species out of my flower garden thinking they were weeds, but end up, you know, destroying something I've been waiting to grow. So there's just something to watch out for. 
Right, so maintaining plant diversity. Uh, a lot of folks uh, forget to do this after they establish a large scale pollinator habitat. So a great way to maintain or increase plant diversity is actual um, this disruption disturbance. So a great way to do this is rotational or strip mowing. Um, you generally want to do this after year three or four of establishment. Um, so what you do, you separate your pollinator habitat into thirds or a fifth, and you only mow that section that year, and then you mow the next section, the next one, you know, this is year maybe four you established it. So you mow this your first year, and then you come through and you mow this the second year, and then you come and mow this one the third year after, you know, the successful establishment. So this is probably year six or so. And doing this and setting the mower blades high, it helps encourage the growth of the suppress, excuse me, suppress species. So this gives like the little guys that, you know, they've been hiding under these big leaves, fellas, a chance to get some of that sunlight and a chance to get ahead and grow. And why you want to separate it into thirds is that you do not want to completely eradicate all your pollinator garden in one setting because then there's going to be no pollen and nectar resources for the pollinators. And that's why you break it up into sections. So that way it's not removing everything at one time. It's only doing it in sections, which is great. Um, if you notice maybe some species getting too aggressive in there, you can just go in there with a weed whacker and go in and you know, species lower them down. Uh, common species that tend to get a little aggressive are like your mints, a uh, bee balm, my absolute favorite, but it tends to get a little aggressive, but that one you can easily just rip it out of the ground because the roots are very shallow. Or you can just go in there with a weed whacker, like whatever makes you happy. Um, and then if you see some invasive species trying to sneak back in, you can um, spot spray it or weed whacker or rip it out by the root if you can. You just want to make sure that the invasive species do not go to seed in your pollinator garden or it can potentially take. So <laughs> if any of those sounded like options that you'd want to do, so maybe you want to create a large scale pollinator habitat with NRCS and you are willing to do at least one tenth of an acre, or if you want to do less but still want some help, uh, you want to contact NRCS. So a great way to get in contact with the right people, so the right office, you can either just contact me directly um, and I can help you get in contact with who you need to. We can get you started. Um, that, or maybe you're not want to do that right now, but maybe something later on you want to look into. Uh, if you just Google NRCS locations, it'll pop right up. Um, or, um, of course, this PDF will be available for whoever wants it. You can just click on this link and it will take you to this web page. Um, <clears throat> it brings up the US, you select your state, and then you can select your county, and it will give you office locations, um, names, telephone numbers, emails. Um, if you want to come in and speak to NRCS staff, uh, make sure that you either call or email in advance. Uh, with COVID, a lot of times, a lot of us are teleworking or there's only one or two people in the office. And if you know they're out in the field, when you come in, you know there might not be anyone there. So just make sure you call or email ahead to make sure someone's gonna be there to meet up with you or to make a farm visit. So what happens when, after you contact NRCS? So uh, the first step is planning. So this is where you discuss your goal with staff to create a conservation plan this is generally we'd go generally one would visit the farm that or the landowner's property and see like what their goals are and it helps us also see opportunities for maybe other conservation goals that maybe one should consider uh, maybe that farmer landowner isn't noticing all the autumn olive or the uh, oriental bittersweet taking over the property and this gives us the opportunity to highlight um that if you know NRCS funding or technical assistance that can help uh, remove that. Um, so after that, uh, you, you get to fill out an application with NRCS staff. Um, you, so you complete the application to see if you qualify for the financial assistance. Uh, NRCS files it and does all that part for you. Um, and then NRCS ranks the applications according to local resource concerns. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, not everyone gets funded, you know, funding is limited. So they want to make sure they select projects that um, I guess have a greater positive impact to the environment. Um, which this, the ranking and finding out if you qualify can sometimes take a while. Um, uh, it can take up to a year sometimes. So like if you are wanting to put in a pollinator habitat and you're thinking, oh yeah, I'll, you know, I'll be ready to get started, you know, this fall or this spring, you know, more than likely not, you're probably gonna have a little bit of a wait ahead, just something to keep in mind, but you know, it's worth the wait that in the back burner. Um, so then after they contact you to let you know that you qualify for the financial assistance, uh, NRCS creates a contract with you and discusses what conservation practices that you are willing to do and when you need to implement them by. So in the contract, it states when you need to get your seeds in the ground, when you're supposed to get things started and make sure that everyone is on the right path. So. So in summary, pollinators provide irreplaceable economic services, pollinating approximately 35% of our crops. Uh, nearly 80% of plant species require a pollinator to successfully reproduce. And by creating a large scale or small scale pollinator habitat with native plants can help our native, our declining native pollinators. Um, just keep in mind when creating a pollinator habitat. Site preparation is the most difficult and crucial step for success. Uh, there are a lot of options, so make sure you choose the option that's best for your landscape, physical capability, time, and access to equipment. Um, and then NRCS offers financial and technical assistance on creating pollinator habitats or gardens. If you need some help, just, you know, send me an email. But they do not do the actual installation. That's a lot of things people don't know about. Uh, they'll contact us, and, you know, they're ready to put in that giant pollinator habitat but then are extremely discouraged when they find out that we aren't the ones that go out there and do it. But there are some local consulting groups in the areas that do install them. They have worked with us before. Uh, and if that's something you are interested in, you know, just contact me and let me know. And I will put you in contact with some folks that I know that can uh, do the project for you. But of course, it's not free. They will charge you. So that's just something to keep in mind. But it's a great option if you want to create that pollinator habitat, but lack the equipment or time, which is great. All right, and with that, that is everything that I have. So I guess now if we want to, I guess, uh, ask some questions or go over some other stuff, I, I am here ready for it. <laughs> Does anybody here have any questions? <laughs> they had forgot it. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I, I'll ask you one. So on the smother crop with buckwheat, you know, when I smother crop, and, and buckwheat would be good for that. How effective is it? I'm thinking of like a pasture that people want to renovate turned to a pollinator area against tall fescue. I know tall fescue can tolerate a lot of shade. I know sometimes we have trouble with um, some of the more traditional like sedan grass and sort of sedan smother now. Have you seen pretty good success with buckwheat and tall fescue? Well, you cut out for most of that question. The only thing I heard was tall fescue. <laughs> Well, you know, with how, in your experience, does buckwheat a good smother crop for tall fescue? Of course, my internet. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it keeps cutting up, but I'm going to assume your question is how effective is smother cropping for using uh, if you have a lot of fescue? So for that one, you would probably need, I would probably say probably two years worth. Of okay, it's buckwheat against tall fescue. Fescue, I would imagine you probably need at least two years of smother cropping to get rid of it. Because as you said before, it doesn't mind the shade, it's very aggressive. So hopefully at least two years worth of uh, cover cropping to smother it out. I think that one would be a little more of a challenge. Yeah. I have a, a small area that's very dry, it's sun facing all the time with um, brick walls that make heat as well. I thought I, I put mulch, there's mulch there. And I thought, well, why don't I just go ahead and put like my soil over top of the mulch to kind of help retain moisture? 
but I don't know if that's good in terms of wanting to plant pollinators. You say plant pumpkins? No, hold on. Roberta, why don't you just come over here by the computer? It'd be okay. easier. I'm trying to repeat that. Uh. I'm sorry, but I have a very small area uh, to plant for pollinators and it's covered in mulch right now. And it's very hot over there all the time, okay. the sun all the time, it has a brick background. So it generates heat. It's like its own, you know, soil mm -hmm. back there. <laughs> so I was wanting to just put <laughs> my soil amendments on top of that mulch to help retain moisture before I plant my pollinators, but I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Or maybe do like a lasagna garden, mulch on the bottom and something. Okay. If you are planning on using seed, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Go sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm done. If you are using seed, oh, I'm sorry, there's like a lag time. <laughs> If you are using seeds, I would recommend not putting the mulch on there because you want the seeds to have good soil contact. But if you are using live plants, that won't be an issue. You know, just move the mulch out of your, okay. your way. Yeah. Um, what type of mulch do you plan on using? Well, right now on top, it's already got this cedar mulch. And I thought, I don't okay. know how to use that. Uh, as I you know, put my soil on top of that and then maybe amend with another layer and, you know, do like a lasagna layer. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're using seeds, I wouldn't put the mulch or move the mulch out of your way. Mm -hmm. uh, seeds are a lot cheaper, but using seeds, uh, if you're using native perennials, it can take up to three years to get a bloom. Mm -hmm. So what I like to rec uh -oh. Recommend what I did. So I put the live plants in first and then where I didn't have plants, I put the seeds down. So that way it was like inexpensive, but I still had blooms immediately because I'm impatient. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any more questions for Lacey? Anybody on Zoom? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just reiterate, you know, Lacey talked about, and I'll talk more next week, but when in terms of plants, it's the law of threes. Three times a year, three species per season. And then if you're doing a planted area, three feet wide, hmm. make sure you have a big enough bloom area. So, but any other questions for Lacey? Lacey, I really appreciate it. This is a great talk. Um, very, informative. very informative. No worries. Very energetic. I'm glad to see someone excited about pollinator. Happy pollinator, well, Thank you. I found out today was the start of happy. Yep. <laughs> so. Good month to have the talk. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lacey. Don't forget, everybody, we'll be here next week, too. Thank you. Thanks again, Lacey.